Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. I'd like to mention that tomorrow is International Peace Day and to introduce our distinguished moderator for today, Atta Argandawal, who like the rest of our panel, our distinguished panel, is a humanitarian, helps people in need and welcomes the stranger. Atta is also the author of several books, including Lost Decency, The Untold Afghan Story. Would you please welcome Atta Argandawal. Thank you very much, Celia. Appreciate it. Uh, welcome, uh, everybody, to the Commonwealth Club of California program today. I'll be your moderator for the virtual program. Uh, we are uh, also going to invite everybody to uh, check online with us at www.commonwealthclub.org. Uh, we are going to have a wonderful panel today and we'll have a great discussion uh, throughout this program. And what we were going to have after this uh, overview and actually a, a slight presentation by our panelists, we are going to have a uh, Q&A session. So please submit your questions through the chat. Uh, now, when it comes to Afghanistan, there are obviously a lots of questions, uh, a lot of questions uh, that the international community will deal with. But the biggest thing uh, the, uh, to really remember is as to what Afghanistan was, and it's probably a very good idea to kind of go back and uh, review at least the five decades of Afghanistan's history to see where Afghanistan one, once one of the uh, most peaceful nations in the world, a darling of the tourist destination, a country that was actually a model of neutrality, a country where basically uh, most of the West had presence, but not in the form of military or let's say uh, presence, uh, if you will. But it was all through cooperation and through project management and through really a presence that really made a difference in lives of many. Uh, so a country again that you know from 1919 all the way through 1978 had a wonderful peaceful time, although there were some choppy uh, periods, of course, uh, throughout that that period of about seven years. But nothing really close to the events that have uh, transpired after 1979 and the invasion of Soviet Union. So the questions all around uh, are just enormous uh, as to what really happened. Uh, and finger pointing, as, as you can imagine, has started all over. And, and there are plenty of you know, players and countries that we can either blame or say who is responsible for. But the reality remains that there are actually, uh, there has been a lot of missteps, mismanagement and uh, actually strategic errors that have been made throughout the last four decades when it comes to Afghanistan. So history will of course write itself and uh, there will be questions. But one thing I can assure everybody is that Afghanistan matters or Afghan questions are not going to go away. Uh, as today, the international community and humanity is actually pretty well aware of the events that have uh, transpired but more importantly, where the Afghan diaspora is now spread out and are being sent out basically through every corner of the world. So the Afghan question again is in everybody's mind and it's going to be there for a very long time. And uh, obviously there will be lots of uh, questions again as to what happened, how a, a tragedy like this can be avoided, but more importantly, maybe a big lesson uh, for the international community as to how those narratives, such as 
nation building and uh, presence, military presence, cooperation, and all of those will actually come to light as the international community grapples with the um, aftermath of Afghanistan. Because again, what has happened in Afghanistan, especially lately, with the jarring events that have taken place, is that something that will not only go away, but it's going to actually create a lot more questions, not only in the form of just you know the military withdrawal, uh, but as to really what has transpired through the last uh, 20 years in general. But also the ramifications in terms of uh, humanitarian, economic, and as well as the terror, terrorism as to how Afghanistan is going to once again fall or is indeed falling, unfortunately, into another safe haven back again. So the ramifications are enormous. Uh, but uh, again, there will be lots of questions. And then we'll hopefully we'll have opportunities for the international community to really once and for all uh, draw some lessons, learn some lessons, and to see what, what can be done to save humanity and save also people of Afghanistan as the longest suffering uh, probably population uh, in history. I know there has been events of many in, around the world and you know the things that we are all aware of, but I think Afghanistan's uh, challenges certainly uh, falls at one of the probably longest, not just the, the longest war, but the longest suffering nation uh, in history. Uh, so now uh, it's uh, time to uh, get our program going and our distinguished panel uh, are uh, made of uh, Humayra Gilzai, Amy Dotson and Steve Miska. We are going to begin with uh, Humayra Gilzai who is the founder of Afghan Network, a cultural expert. And uh, I believe she also blogs pretty much uh, as far as uh, some of the cultural areas and also as far as food. I've seen her work, she does a terrific job. So with that, I wanna welcome Pomera. Thank you so much, uh, Atal, for that introduction and also for the Commonwealth Club for um, having this program as um, many of us in the diaspora are uh, thoroughly immersed in the Afghan news and such uh, and, and are in direct contact with all of our uh, friends and colleagues in Afghanistan. Um, I'm seeing that in the press, Afghanistan is starting to fall in the back pages. But before I start my presentation, I want to do a quick land acknowledgement that I'm calling from the late of lands of Ramatushaluni, colonially known as San Francisco. And once again, thank you for having me on this panel. Um, I, I have to admit that since August 15th, my life has been um, really turned upside down in the sense that many of us in the diaspora uh, have been watching uh, the tragedy of Afghanistan unfold with very little that we could do to help. Um, I believe myself, um, even our moderator Atta and uh, many of the Afghan diaspora are still processing what has happened and and with um, fear we watch what will be unfolding ahead of us. Um, we've all done our best to try to help our friends, colleagues uh, and family members um, get out of Afghanistan, most likely unsuccessfully or find some safe areas to go to. However, um, the Afghan economy is falling apart and there are so many other things that are affecting the Afghan people. Um, but what I want to do is uh, start out by just reminding everybody what happened. Uh, in April, President Biden announced that the remaining 3,000 U.S. troops in Afghanistan would be withdrawn on September 11, 2021. Um, at that po point, the 8,000 allied troops and 18,000 contractors that Afghan forces relied upon to operate the Air Force and provide logistic support also left. So in the recent months before the uh, soft coup, uh, the Afghan military was unable to provide vital supplies, such as food and ammunition to outposts scattered throughout the country. And through the soft coup, the Taliban 
uh, as we all know, very quickly uh, took over the country and they took over um, Kabul on August 15th and the Afghan government collapsed. And that uh, was basically the final chapter of the U.S. withdrawal through this catastrophe. Uh, at this point, um, the U.S., Germany, Britain, Canada, Pakistan, Switzerland, and the United Nations have evacuated their nationals out of Afghanistan, and they've suspended any type of support in Afghanistan. And how was it that we thought that the Afghan army, the government would be able to hold up against the Taliban? while we have extensive intelligence or we claim to have extensive intelligence within the country. Um, these are some questions that we uh, have been asking and many people in the diaspora as well as the press have been wondering, um, why did the Biden government allow this catastrophe of world withdrawal to take place? We're not saying that the U.S. should have stayed, but the withdrawal could have been a much more orderly way there could have been more support to help the Afghan government stay in power. Um, also, why didn't the U.S. act sooner to um, withdraw the American assets and Afghan allies starting in May when the September 11th uh, withdrawal was set? Why did we allow the hard work of our servicemen and women go to waste with this terrible final chapter uh, where we basically through delegitimizing the Afghan government and shaking hands with the um, Afghan uh, Taliban uh, in Doha, uh, legitimized the Taliban government and allowed them to um, basically be emboldened to do this kind of work. Uh, at this point, uh, through my personal contacts, as well as many friends and colleagues um, who also have contacts in Afghanistan, uh, we are hearing that the Afghan people feel abandoned and alone as um, all the development that has been made in Afghanistan in the past 20, 20 years are um, unfolding right in front of us and falling apart. And people the U.S. and other countries are slowly losing interest in the Afghan um, uh, tragedy and, and plight, um, pegging it as a civil war or um, something that needs to be handled in, internally within the government while it was all really created based on external meddling. So the I was asked to give a current status of Afghan people and Afghan women. And what I can tell you that the Afghan people, especially in the cities, are scared about their uncertain future. Um, many, many Afghans have been internally displaced and many are escaping um, to Pakistan over the borders. And as we all know, and we'll hear from Amy, how many are trying to leave. But that's basically around 100 to 200,000 people that we're talking about who would be coming to the West. Afghanistan is a country of 40 million people. Those people will have to live under the rule of Taliban. And many of them are afraid of the republic reprisals that will be made against them, um, against educated women, against thought leaders, filmmakers, journalists, and many of um, the uh, people who were educated and were in government positions and such and uh, advocates were able to leave Af Afghanistan, but many are have not been able to. And I personally have mixed feelings about the departure of the educated class um, because then there's brain drain in the country and those are some of the people who really stood side by side with the US and rebuilt Afghanistan. And once they leave, um, then who is going to be there to resist the Taliban? Of course, I'm in a place of privilege and living in the United States, so I don't feel that that is a wrong wish but i also fear what it would how it would affect the future of the country uh, many of the educated class journalists uh, artists are fearful and hiding and they're in need of protection women and girls especially in the cities are concerned about their future um, and you may all have heard um, the past three days 
boys' schools have opened, but um, girls' schools uh, from grade 7 to 12 has not been reopened, and um, there has not been really any news of when that might happen. Also, it has been announced that women uh, who uh, were working um, are not to return to work and leave their jobs to men who can do their work. So basically, if you did a job that a man can do instead of you, then that is going to be given to a man and you are not to return to work. Um, I just want to remind everyone that the Afghan constitution had mandated that 25% of the parliamentary seats are held by women, um, but the Taliban have not uh, appointed a single woman in any type of leadership role. Currently, 2 million Afghan women are widows, and many of them are concerned that if the Taliban instilled the Maram rule, which is that you cannot leave uh, your home or go outside without a male um, chaperone, that would normally be a husband, uncle, brother, uh, son, then you cannot be outside. If um, the Taliban have not really um, made it clear what their mandate is going to be. They're kind of skirting around this issue, um, but that is something that is looming on the minds of many Afghan women. Um, and also as uh, a, another show of where things are going, the Taliban have closed the Ministry of Women's Affairs and turned the building into the Ministry of Virtue and Vice. That was the ministry that basically um, uh, enforced all the rules of Taliban 1.0 that women had to be covered, men had to have a beard a certain length and all those other draconian codes of um, clothing and behavior. Um, as we all know, uh, historically that a country doesn't thrive economically or civically with half of its population hidden behind walls. Um, so this uncertain future is um, not only terrifying, but it's ex exasperating uh, a lot of the Afghan women who are basically uh, waiting to see what happens to them. Uh, of course, all of this humanitarian issues, uh, uh, as we are watching it unfold, uh, we have to remember that Afghanistan is suffering from uh, drought and, of course, COVID like the rest of the world. And um, Afghanistan has been isolated economically um, when the U.S. froze nine and a half billion dollars of Afghan banks' assets. And when you, um, uh, when our government did this, um, who is going to suffer from this? It's not going to be the head of the Taliban. They have access to funds. It's the Afghan people who are not receiving their salaries. It's the fact that the government can't pay the duties for goods that need to be imported in Afghanistan, and all those trucks are going to be turned away. Um, and this is uh, causing a major economic catastrophe for Afghanistan. Uh, at this point, even Afghans who are wealthy or had money in the bank cannot access their funds because they're being held overseas. Um, they are only allowed to withdraw $200 a week of cash, and that is basically after standing in line for a day or two. Inflation is costing the cost of flour, oil, sugar, and basic necessities of Afghan people to skyrocket. So um, currently, the country is heading towards a winter uh, with all these obstacles against it, and a lot of us are very concerned about what these sanctions and um, freezing up assets could mean to the Afghan people. I mean, we really know what it means, but what we're not sure about is what the intention is for the U.S. And once again, it's under the guise that we are influencing the Taliban to uh, protect Afghan women and such, but clearly that is not working. Um, if this is to hold the money over the Taliban so we can get intelligence from them and help the U.S., um, uh, identify any terrorist activities, then why should the Afghan people suffer from that? So um, one thing I do know about the Afghan women who I've worked with in the past 18 years are that they're going to fight for their rights. 
um, that were given to them under the Afghan constitution, uh, which is in line with the rights that were given to women in Islam. So a lot of us are scratching our heads and wondering um, what Islam is uh, the Taliban following. It has um, that does not align at all with um, how other Islamic countries are treating women. Uh, I, today on Twitter, I saw a tweet from um, Afghan woman under the um, uh, Twitter handle Shola, and she said Afghan women need health care, education, jobs, and freedom of self determination. They can't be kept hostage to the values of a few. Culture of fear and oppression is not governance, nor can be disguised as protection. So my hope is that Afghan men will stand side by side with these women. And in the West, if we sit with our arms folded around our chest while othering what is happening to the Afghan women, what does it say about us? What does it say to our daughters about what injustices we are willing to tolerate? accept and peg as regional or cultural issues in order to make ourselves feel better so we can go back to our lives without feeling like we had something to do with the Afghanistan disaster. Thank you so much and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Humaira. A wonderful job as always. Uh, as everybody knows, uh, women progress in general in Afghanistan in the last 20 years has been actually is the highlight of the achievements uh, in the progress in Afghanistan. So, and thank you for uh, to you and thanks to all the other uh, women advocates uh, who will continue to really represent and be the voice of women in Afghanistan. So thank you again. Now, uh, next to our next distinguished panel uh, panelist, Amy Dotson, who is the uh, who's the, the volunteer services manager at JFCS, uh, Jewish Family Community Center here in the East Bay. And they have done a terrific job. They've been a great partner uh, with many for a long time. So we want to welcome and Amy with that alternative. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Commonwealth for, uh, for hosting this and for inviting me to speak. It's an honor to be here. Uh, so I'm, uh, as Atas said, I'm the volunteer services manager at JFCS East Bay. We are a local refugee resettlement agency, and we've actually been uh, operating since 1877. So we have 144 years of experience resettling refugees in the East Bay. Um, we've, and we've been specifically uh, resettling Afghans since about 2008. Uh, so we were very well positioned when uh, the current crisis happened uh, to really be a, a force on the ground for um, helping uh, people resettle in the Bay Area. Uh, JFCS is an affiliate of HIAS, uh, the Hebrew International Aid Society. And so we are one of the 16 nationwide affiliates uh, from HIAS. They're the national organization that contracts with the federal government and the Office of Refugee Resettlement and the conduit through which our clients come to us. Uh, so we've been busy. <laughs> it's been, it's been, we were busy before the current crisis and, and we're, we've been very busy very busy lately. Um, in the month of August, JFCS resettled 80 Afghan individuals and also a family of six from Burma. So 86 individuals in the month of August alone. Um, we have resettled uh, about 20 people so far in September and we have 33 more in our pipeline that we're expecting imminently. And uh, just to put that into context, um, uh, pre, you know, pre, pre this current crisis, uh, JFCS would typically resettle uh, around 130 people a year. Um, so in a six month period, we might do 65, 70 people. So 80 people in, in one month is uh, more than six months worth of a, a normal schedule for us. So it's, it's been busy. <laughs> um, uh, we operate on the, uh, on the federal fiscal year. So um, our, that means our, uh, we're, in, we're about to begin FY22. So that's October 1st, 2021 through September 30th of 2022. Uh, Pre-crisis, we were anticipating uh, resettling 170 refugees globally and 120 specifically Afghan refugees for a total of 290 people. So we were already kind of expecting to double or triple the work that we normally do in a year. Um, with the 
crisis of the last month, uh, we expect that number to be even much, much higher. So um, who are these people? <laughs> um, we primarily are resettling Afghan SIV holders. So an SIV is a special immigrant visa. Um, Afghans who aided or worked for the United States military during the last 20 years are eligible to apply for this special visa. Um, so we're thinking, you know, think about the, the translators and the drivers and the people on the ground and even, even the janitorial staff at the U.S. bases, right? Even those, you know, people from all levels um, are eligible for this visa because they are being targeted uh, by the Taliban. Um, so the normal process for uh, receiving an SIV usually takes about two years um, for the vetting process to go through. The government is expediting that as quickly as they can, uh, but there are still a lot of people who are eligible for an SIV uh, and therefore at risk of um, retribution from the Taliban. And those people are now being classified as um, humanitarian parolees. And you may have seen or heard that term in the news, parolees. Um, so the, the humanitarian parolees, are a, it's an entirely different project uh, in terms of resettlement than the SIV holders. Uh, and we are in. We are expecting between now and March 31st of next year, we've agreed to resettle uh, 100 or more parolees, uh, and that's in addition to all of the SIV holders that we uh, and their families that we'll be resettling. Um, the um, SIVs are SIV refugees are eligible for all social services, um, Medi-Cal, uh, CalFresh. Uh, and they also receive um, resettlement funds from the federal government. Uh, the parolees get none of that. They are, um, they're not eligible for a lot of the same benefits and they don't receive cash assistance. Um, so we have been, um, as an agency, working very hard to make sure that we are um, ready for all of these people and that we can support them uh, and meet all of their needs. Um, so, and uh, the Bay Area is highly impacted because there are so many, there's such a vibrant Afghan community here already. We try to resettle people where they have a U.S. tie, where they have uh, family members and friends and a community uh, to, to engage with. So in the Bay Area, in the East Bay, that's mostly Concord, uh, Hayward, and Fremont. Um, most of our clients are, most of the clients that we are resettling are um, going to Concord uh, or Hayward. Um, and from what I hear, there are still lots and lots of SIV holders still trapped in Afghanistan. Um, I don't, one of the other panelists might have a better idea of the exact number. I've heard anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000. Uh, nobody seems to know exactly, but there are certainly lots of people still trapped inside Afghanistan um, trying to get out uh, and who are um, who are eligible to leave, right? Who, who have, who are eligible for these visas and in, entitled uh, to come to the United States. Um, so um, in terms of what uh, JFCS does, we are, we're not involved in getting people out of the country, right? That, that happens on a, on a federal level and a little higher, but uh, we, we, as soon as their plane touches the ground, that's when we leap into action. Um, so our federal contracts have a very, um, a very, they require very specific services. Uh, and that's everything from meeting a family at the airport to making sure they have a culturally appropriate hot meal ready for them when they arrive, uh, to signing them up for all of the benefits they're entitled to uh, and offering um, thorough and comprehensive case management for the 90 days of their um, resettlement and placement period. So a family is assigned a case manager. That case manager works with them very closely for the first 90 days they are here. Uh, and then usually by the end of those 90 days, the family is ready to be a little bit more self-sufficient. Um, if, if not, if there's a family that needs more support, we do have another program that we can enroll people into uh, that provides case management, intensive case management service for an additional year. And that's generally for people who maybe have high medical needs or um, uh, have, have, a, have a different set of needs uh, that uh, takes them beyond the 90-day the resettlement period. Um, 
So the case managers do a lot in those first 90 days, um, but we also have a, a amazing team of volunteers. And that's, that's my piece as the volunteer services manager. I oversee all of the volunteers uh, that we have working with the agency. Um, Pre-crisis, we had about 400 volunteers working with us in all kinds of capacities. Um, in the last month, we have had uh, more than 3,300 people <laughs> sign up to volunteer. So um, it's, been, um, uh, it's been overwhelming. It's been wonderful, wonderful and heartwarming and a little overwhelming. So if you're watching this and thinking, I signed up to volunteer and I never heard anything back, we'll, we'll get to you eventually. <laughs> we're just, we're awfully, um, <clears throat> awfully backlogged. Um, but it's been, um, it's been, it's been such a privilege to be in this position. We get to see this amazing outpouring of support from our East Bay community. We, uh, it's, it's just been, it's been beautiful to witness, honestly. Um, so we are doing our best to connect, uh, volunteers with clients and find, you know, things for these volunteers to do. I mean, I'll be honest, I don't really have 3,000 volunteer jobs, um, but we're trying to engage as many people as we possibly can. Um, so if you're wondering, um, you know, the, uh, what, what you can do to get involved, um, certainly fill out our, our volunteer form and, and join the list of 3,348 as of this morning. Um, and then uh, we're also operating uh, an Amazon wish list. And if you want to do something today, that's really the, the best way to help. We, we provide um, a lot, uh, the agency provides all kinds of um, goods, and, goods and services for our clients. So once, we, once a client has uh, been moved into housing, we help them find an apartment, we help them find a co-signer for their lease, uh, and then we furnish their apartments. They um, get everything from toothbrushes to toasters, uh, you know, to beds and everything, and we provide all of that. Um, some of that is through funding, but a lot of that is through our volunteer community. We run a very robust in-kind donations program. Uh, so every, you know, um, every piece of furniture that we put in a client's apartment has, most of it has been donated. Um, so, and we also provide all kinds of housewares. So the, um, so the furniture is covered for the moment, um, but we're still in need of things like dish sets and, uh, you know, sponges and, and uh, shampoo. So that's all on the Amazon wish list. And we curate that multiple times a day so that it's always reflecting our most current needs. So, um, so yeah, so if you want to know, you know, what, what, what does a family that arrived yesterday need today, it'll be on that list. Um, I have, um, I have lots more that I could, I could go on and on. Um, but I think I'll, I'll turn it back to Atta now and I'll look forward, uh, I hope, to a lot of questions during the Q&A. There's, there's a lot more I can say about um, specific, uh, specific volunteer opportunities and um, specifics on how the agency uh, operates uh, in refugee resettlement. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Amy, for the wonderful job uh, your organization does. It's, it's amazing that uh, you have such a credible history of service and uh, we appreciate it. And they, obviously the list of, you know, over thousands of people volunteering that, uh, that speaks volume and the respect that your organization has, uh, has. And in the meantime, as I said the other day, and we mentioned over the phone to you, uh, we will hopefully cooperate with our organizations to actually make the best of these volunteers and the work that, that uh, goes around. So thank you again, uh, Amy. And let's uh, now welcome uh, Steve Niska. Uh, who is a retired colonel. He's the author of Baghdad's uh, Underground Railroad. Uh, Steve has done a phenomenal job of uh, helping out uh, interpreters, uh, refugees, and SIVs. And I think there is a lot more that um, what, we, uh, what I've gathered so far. So Steve, we really appreciate uh, you being here and uh, uh, please share your experience and uh, what's really happening in, the, in this uh, critical time. On to you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Ada. And uh, I just want to say it's a it's an honor to join Amara and Amy on this uh, panel today. Um, I uh, first got involved with SIVs when I was in Baghdad in 2006 and seven, and my interpreters started being killed out from underneath me. I spent about 40 months on the ground in in Iraq, and uh, so I came back to Washington D.C. with this burning issue of why 
we as a country were not doing a good job of protecting and insulating our closest Iraqi, Afghan, Somali, Yemeni, you know, wherever we happen to be in a conflict zone, why were we not doing a better job of protecting them? And so I've spent a lot of time in this space thinking about it, publishing, writing. Um, and uh, as once the president made the, the decision to withdraw, um, I was asked to join a coalition of nonprofits, mainly uh, based out of Washington, DC, but not primarily um, organizations like the International Refugee Assistance Project is, does pro bono legal support in New York City. Um, but Human Rights First was leading this charge through a program called Veterans for American Ideals. And I've been a member uh, for quite some time. And so we started advocating to the administration not to let this become a crisis, to get ahead of it and begin evacuating our uh, the most vulnerable uh, Afghan partners uh, beforehand. Um, as the uh, what I would call a train wreck was approaching, we quickly realized that um, it wasn't going to turn out well. And so the veteran community, thousands of veterans are active and engaged right now, even uh, we haven't given up in uh, looking for solutions to help find safe passage for uh, vulnerable Afghans and, and not just special immigrant visa holders of which you know, by mid-August, there were 20,000 principal applicants, but when you factor in their family members, you're talking a population of about 80,000 people. But when you look at the, the defense contracting community that basically was pulled out with uh, the U.S. military and NATO partners, you're talking tens of thousands, and I've heard orders of magnitude greater in terms of people who are highly at risk. And so for, I apologize to everybody because I don't, haven't gotten a lot of sleep in the last month after this, um, this debacle began unraveling. And I've spent the, almost the entire time in Los Angeles at the Pacific Council on International Policy. They basically gave us their entire office suite to run a 24 seven operations center to help not just Afghans uh, get out or to help coordinate operations on the ground in Afghanistan, but also to look at the entire evacuation pipeline from Afghanistan to third countries, whether they're the government, um, third countries where the US evacuated people to or others where people were fortunate enough to get taken by um, veterans and, and other organizations that were able to get people out. Those efforts continue to this day. Um, they involve, and we also, as I complete the picture of the pipeline, we're also covering the eight military bases in the United States, where there's a population of about 40,000 Afghans. All of the SIV applicants, uh, American citizens, and legal permanent residents have been allowed to pass through and move on to wherever their destinations were supposed to be. But uh, the remaining population is in either a P2 category visa or some other form of, of visa. And as Amy mentioned, uh, they, the reason they were able to be brought into the United States was via humanitarian parole which does not afford a legal status to them at all. It's basically legal limbo until such time as the government figures out how to give them a status, which then could potentially uh, afford them many of the benefits that Amy was talking about. Um, so anyway, we look at the entire pipeline and we have, what we do is we help connect organizations like Amy's organization to maybe nonprofits who operate in the San Francisco area. Uh, Miri's List comes to mind um, where she complements government resettlement agencies and other organizations. She's got uh, offices in now, I think, 21 different states, um, but started in Los Angeles to welcome uh, vulnerable refugees coming in. And um, what we do is uh, we just try to 
with this operations center, um, the, we, we operate on two principles. The first one is uh, humility, that the idea that somebody 9,000 miles away can tell a family what to do in Kabul right now is um, not the smartest thing as me speaking as a, an operator, somebody being on the ground. Uh, but what we do do is we provide them the, the information, the best information we possibly can to help them weigh their individual risks and make the decisions for themselves. And we also try to connect them with resources on the ground that can help. So for example, digital hygiene, the first thing that happens if the Taliban detain you is they, they open up your phone and they start checking your social media profiles, your Google searches, stuff like that to determine whether or not you have a Western affiliation or what other sorts of affiliations you have. So we help with tools like how to clean up your profiles so that it makes it more difficult. How to avoid biometric checks, which unfortunately the Taliban now have by virtue of us training the Afghan National Security Forces on how to use biometric equipment. Um, so we do things like that, as well as help people get to safe houses. And then in many cases, we um, we will never not answer the phone, but we, we don't have the capacity to, to handle the tens of thousands of of requests that come in. And so what we what we attempt to do is refer people to the organizations that we know are working on whatever problem they happen to have at the time. And so the, the, the first in, you know, principle is humility, but the second one is empathy. It's our, our operators always pick up the phone seeking to understand the person on the other end, whether they're in Afghanistan or they're stressed out here in the United States, worried about somebody in Afghanistan or they can't find somebody who was evacuated, but they're stuck in um, Doha in Qatar somewhere. And they're tr just trying to get a message to their loved ones. So our operators um, will always respond, but I will tell you the demand has been completely off the hook and it's been extremely challenging. I will, you know, on a personal note, this, whole experience over the last month was more difficult for me than spending 16 months in Baghdad at the height of sectarian cleansing. It's been really brutal. And uh, the thing that is heartening to me is that I, I work alongside so many humanitarian partners like Umera and Amy. I work alongside so many veterans that refuse to give up and that will continue to honor our ethos, which was in, inculcated in us in our time of service of leave nobody behind. And our government, uh, thankfully, has recognized that these communities will not stop. And they are now working to coordinate more closely with us to at least um, not interfere with the efforts that are going on and hopefully synchronize them a little bit better. And, um, and uh, our organizations are, are directly in contact with uh, members of Congress, as well as senior members of the government to make sure we align those, those interests better and continue working to safeguard our, our closest Afghan partners. So I'll leave it there, Ada. And uh, I look, also look forward to any questions the audience might have. Thank you very much, Steve, and uh, really for your service, sir, and uh, for all of the work you do, uh, just quality work and uh, to add value and make a difference in lives of others. So we do appreciate it. Uh, I want to remind everybody in our streaming audience that uh, today's program is uh, coordinated uh, by Middle East, uh, Commonwealth Club's Middle East led forum. Uh, forum. Uh, so uh, we do have lots of questions, um, and why don't we start with the one? Um, involving Afghan people. So Homera, if I can, maybe you can start to comment on this. And the question is whether uh, in light of all of, of course, the uh, corruptions and the things that people are familiar with and heard, uh, the question is whether are there Afghans in Afghanistan or what majority of the Afghans uh, have been happy with the um, US and international presence uh, and cooperation? Um, so is the question, are the, 
there are any Afghans who've been happy with the past 20 years or in the past couple? The past 20 years. I believe that's the question is actually points to the presence of US in NATO forces. Uh, so that's, I believe, the big, the big question as to what percentage of people maybe, how about the reaction from people in, inside Afghanistan? Well, um, th that's a difficult question to answer in the sense that um, the Afghan people, first of all, have no qualms with the American people. Um, Afghans actually love Americans. And when I went back to Afghanistan as an Afghan American, uh, I got double love, <laughs> both as an Afghan and as an American. Um, so I just want to make that clear. As far as the um, Afghans are concerned, they're very pragmatic people and they're not blind. I mean, of course, they've seen uh, the work that the uh, U.S., especially the servicemen and women who, who have done uh, around uh, community building, um, uh, around building schools, um, providing um, support to women, to men, to uh, a lot of the local projects that were being done. For example, I was in a forward operating base in Ghazni, and I was just blown away by how, how compassionate our servicemen and women were about their work and how um, they did the local projects um, um, through uh, the provincial reconstructions teams with so much care and respect for the Afghan people. I think the issue that the Afghans have had um, is the a lack of uh, strategy on the U.S. involvement in Afghanistan. You know, we went in 2001 after Al Qaeda um, uh, forces that uh, attacked the United States in 9/11. Um, but and then we there was a lot of promises made to the Afghans. But then just a few years later, we pulled out all of our forces and then send it to Iraq, and that was basically when the power vacuum uh, was created and the Taliban uh, resurgence happened. Um, one of the other things, uh, so, so, and that has happened uh, over and over, and, and as we have also learned through the Afghanistan papers that the Washington Post released, um, there were a lot of efforts that were being made, both military as well as uh, intelligence and, and through the State Department and such, that were counter to what worked in Afghanistan. There wasn't any really local knowledge. Um, the U.S. did, uh, and this is not a conspiracy, everybody knows it, worked with a lot of warlords, paid them for intelligence. Um, so that created its own um, power structures within Afghanistan that has worked counter um, to what the mission in the U uh, for the uh, uh, U.S. forces war. So there's been a lot of confusion, mix-up, and um, lack of strategy that has uh, affected the Afghan people directly, especially with drone attacks um, and uh, searches of people's homes and a variety of different like tactical things that were happening in Afghanistan uh, that was not really in line with um, Afghan culture, and there was a lot of death with Afghan civilians. So th there isn't one answer to this. I think that Afghans recognize a lot of what was um, done as far as creating the Afghan constitution, recreating a whole finance system, uh, women's rights, human rights, um, but they also realized uh, that on the military side, um, there were just a lot of things that uh, weren't executed well, and it caused a Thank lot you. of deaths. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, that, that, that's excellent. Now, uh, there, obviously, there are a lot of questions that we're uh, getting here, but uh, some of them, let me just combine a couple here, and uh, that will be uh, directed to Steve, if you will uh, kindly comment on this. Uh, there have been uh, questions are that there are a lot of approved processes or SIVs that have been approved, but there are still people on the ground or in Afghanistan. Uh, and what are you hearing as to what really, what are the opportunities for these people and how can they get out to make it out of Afghanistan? 
Yeah, um, so currently we haven't seen a lot of movement with special immigrant visa applicants with respect to the, the flights that um, some people may have seen, some limited flights have mainly been foreign passport holders um, being allowed to leave. But those negotiations, I believe, are still ongoing, and it remains to be seen. Um, and, uh, and this was what has been so hard to communicate to people on the ground. I mean, for Afghans, the evacuation was essentially over when uh, the bomb hit the airport. Um, there, it was almost impossible to get somebody into the airport in Kabul after that. And all of the other airports had already f uh, fallen to the Taliban. So Kabul was it. It was the only place to go. Um, and so for several weeks now, we've been attempting to see what normal would look like under the Taliban with a return to commercial air traffic. And we're starting to see some of that. Uh, they've outsourced it to the Qataris with respect to air traffic control. And um, we do, I, I think it's too early to tell, specifically with respect to special immigrant visa holders and, and other at-risk categories, what the challenges are going to be. Uh, um, and the two categories in particular that, that I distinguish between if somebody has a passport and visa, um, that's a huge advantage over having to go to a Taliban controlled ministry to get that now. And um, so depending on where people are in, in every case is individual, um, it just, it, you know, I can't really give a better answer than that. Thank you. I... No, totally understandable. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question will, uh, will be to uh, Amy. Uh, Amy, do you have uh, any idea uh, from uh, U.S. standpoint as to how many refugees or uh, the new arrivals are, uh, how are they allocating uh, these folks over to the regions and especially in this region? Do you know what we anticipate, can anticipate in Northern California? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, on a national level, California actually uh, receives about a third, usually a little bit more, usually like 30, 35 percent of the nation's overall refugees. So at the, of the entire you know, body of people that are coming into this country, um, about a third of them come to California. Um, a lot of them get resettled in Southern California, um, but there are, um, there are multiple resettlement agencies in Northern California. I mean, there's us <clears throat> here in the East Bay. We also have an affiliate in San Francisco and the International Rescue Committee, IRC has um, offices in Oakland and San Jose, uh, and I believe Sacramento as well. There's a, there's a lot of people going to Sacramento. Um, in terms of actual numbers, um, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, it is, it's in the thousands. I mean, you know, there's, there, there are lots and lots of people who will be coming uh, to Northern California. Things have slowed down a little bit um, because of some of the public health, health uh, outbreaks in, uh, at the, like at Fort Lee and some of the other places where uh, people have gotten to America. And there's, I think there was a measles outbreak. Um, and so they aren't putting people on planes to their final destinations quite as quickly. Uh, so we've seen a little bit of a slowdown just in the last week, but uh, we are expecting that to ramp up again very quickly. Uh, and in fact, actually just this morning, I got an alert from our system saying that there's two new families have been uh, approved and are, are coming tomorrow. Thank you, Amy, appreciate that. So now we have only a few more minutes, but I hope we'll have future opportunities to uh, expand. But uh, now this, this question, actually, if you could all, uh, three of you, if you could just comment based on your uh, understanding of what's happening. Uh, the question is from several audiences, what do you think, how, what does the whole, uh, what does it hold for Afghanistan? Uh, what does the future hold? If you could just briefly comment, uh, starting with Humaira, that would be great. Well, on the short term, I see a humanitarian disaster looming just um, around the corner with winter coming uh, and uh, the economy um, not having any cash to go through uh, and pay the employees to, for people to be able to with, withdraw the funds that they have. Um, I wanna make sure that people know that the nine and a half billions dollars is the 
Afghanistan's money. This is not aid money. This is money that was held in New York Reserve uh, as part of the structure of the Afghan finance system that was created. And to be honest with you, that's as far as I can think uh, about the future of Afghanistan is what is going to happen to the people. Um, and um, I don't see the Taliban going anywhere. And although I am definitely not a fan of theirs, I feel like uh, we need to start finding a way to work with them. Thank you, Mara. Steve? I would echo Amara's comments. Um, it's, I do think, and I, I think our government understands that there is a need to figure out what working with the Taliban looks like and attempting to mitigate the humanitarian crisis, which is playing out right now, quite frankly. Um, and it will only get worse as the winter season comes. Um, the, that we've seen infighting within the Taliban, and we should expect to see more of that. Um, I, I would be reluctant to, to advocate, to attempt to take advantage of that. I think um, as, a, as a country, we just, we don't exercise enough humility in our foreign policy. And we really need to focus on the humanitarian fallout from this withdrawal and an attempt to alleviate that through uh, not just our own resources, but our leadership in the inter international community to help uh, bring other countries to the table along with UNHCR and others um, so that we can mitigate it to the extent that we can. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Amy? Thank you. Um, it's a great question. I don't know that I'm um, uh, the best person to answer for the future of Afghanistan, but I, what I will say is that for the, the future of the people that are coming here and that are that are making it here, um, you know, they're they're arriving with a lot of trauma, um, and I think um, you know what what we can do as a community here in the West is um, be very sensitive to that trauma uh, and be very empathetic and compassionate uh, and really think about how you know how how we as a community can make this the most welcoming uh, place possible for the for these people who are coming here who have been. Uh, really traumatized by um, by a situation completely out of their control. Thank you, I mean, that's exactly what we're hearing all over as we are in touch as the Humaira uh, and other advocates are all aware. Uh, we're hearing some incredible stories. I mean, it's really, really amazing uh, as to what's happening uh, throughout as the uh, these refugees are sent and uh, some mostly in state of shock, chaos and uh, but so it's, you're absolutely right. It is very difficult uh, situation. Uh, and again, we'll really hope to have opportunities to expand and we'll have you all in the future uh, to expand and uh, share more experiences. But uh, we wanna thank you, um, um, Humaira, Steve and Amy for a wonderful job today. And uh, again, for your cooperation and all of what you do. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, wish we had more time, but we don't. Uh, we want to let you know that we really too appreciate everybody, of course, all of the audiences throughout uh, for listening and tuning in today to Commonwealth Club's uh, uh, program, uh, celebrating 117 years of enlightened conversations. Uh, so again, we all appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. And uh, with that, uh, our um, program for today is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Ada. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thank it. you so much. It's been an honor and a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.